In this video, we are going to very quickly look at the question, what is a computer? In other words, what would we consider as the core idea of a computer? What is the kind of behavior that we expect? And how does a computer get used? This is a precursor to what we will be doing next, which is basically examining what happens when you actually start running a program on a computer. So one of the assumptions I'm going to make over here is that even though you have so far been looking at how we can go around constructing the idea of a data path and control. At this point, I'm going to straight away jump ahead and assume that you are already familiar with the basics of programming and in particular that you understand a little bit about assembly language. In subsequent sessions, we will actually be looking a bit deeper into assembly language and coming up with how an instruction set can be designed. But for the time being, I'm going to assume that we already know what an instruction set looks like, what an assembly language program looks like, and discuss a little bit about the behavior of such programs. So we are basically going to try and answer these questions. What is a computer? What is a program? And what is an operating system? At a very, very high superficial level, without going really into the depths of how an operating system, for example, gets implemented, or even about what are the kinds of optimizations or better ways that you can write programs. The first question, what is a computer? When you say computer, do you think of this, which is the Fugaku supercomputer that was recently commissioned in the Riken Institute in Japan, capable of performing 415 petaflops, 415 into 10 to the power of 15 floating point operations per second. Computationally, this machine actually consists of something like 7 million processor cores, each of which is an ARM processor similar to what you would find in slightly older phones. Maybe in modern phones, you might have each individual phone has around four processor cores or so. This one has 7 million of them. At the other extreme, you have the Arduino, a single ARM process, ARM-like processor core. It's actually the Atmega processor. This is primarily meant as a hobby system, operates at a 16 megahertz clock, has no native floating point support. Just based on the clock, frequency and the number of operations per second, you can see that the supercomputer can do something like 10 to the power of 10 or 10 to the power of 11 more operations per second than the Arduino. But the bottom line is both are computationally capable of doing exactly the same thing. And that is part of the magic of the whole theory of computer science. Right? The fact that there is some notion of computability and that except for the fact that the Arduino is going to be slow, it can do exactly the same work as any supercomputer. Now, what that means is we need to have some kind of a general notion of the minimum set of functionality that we require within a computer, which allows it to have this kind of behavior. And although we will not be going into the details of that as part of this course, ultimately what we will be doing is coming up with simple instruction sets and saying, okay, how do we actually take this instruction set, implement it, and thereby get something which is computationally equivalent to any other processor that is available. So the core components of any computer, the first one that we are primarily interested in is a central processing unit. Its job is to fetch and execute instructions as per some well-defined instruction set architecture. In other words, there is some set of instructions that is known that defines the instruction set architecture or ISA and the processor itself needs to fetch instructions based on this ISA and execute them in some way. Now, the processor by itself would be very limited in terms of what it can do. It might at best have some kind of local registers and an address bus or a data bus by which it can try to communicate with the outside world, but there has to be something that it can communicate with. And the primary thing that it needs is some kind of storage memory where it can store data for processing and also the instructions that it actually needs to execute. Along with that, we might also have some kind of long-term storage, either magnetic disk, magnetic tape, solid state drives, some kind of non-volatile storage, which is sort of long-term in the sense that even if the system is powered off, it would still be able to recover or restore the state at some point in time. And also for actually storing information which cannot be processed within 
just the time that the computer is on. Now the CPU is still the master here. It controls what goes in and out of its core. And what we can do is by writing appropriate programs, decide how this interaction between the CPU and the storage happens. Apart from this, of course, in order to be really useful, you need to have some kind of peripherals. These are for interaction with the outside world. Interaction meaning it could be interaction with a human. And these are typically low speed devices, keyboard, mouse, printers, etc. There could be some high speed devices like video display units or monitors. But typically the high speed peripherals are going to be for bulk data transfer. They allow you to copy files or copy data between machines or from one place to another. And from the point of view of building a computer, the CPU, the core, must be capable of communicating with these peripherals. So one of the important tasks that we will need to accomplish in the process of designing a computer would be how does the CPU core that we are designing actually develop the ability to communicate with something outside of itself. Next, we come to the question of what is a program? And over here, I'm just going to basically say it's a sequence of instructions. What are instructions? In the last video on the generalized data path and control, we saw that an instruction could be thought of as just something which tells you where to get the data for the arithmetic unit from and where to send the output of the arithmetic unit and also what type of operation. There are some other types of instructions as well that are required for a general purpose CPU but they all follow a similar kind of pattern. They essentially encode some kind of functionality that the CPU needs to perform. The CPU reads these instructions one or sometimes more than one at a time and executes them. And typically the types of instructions that are needed, the foremost would be the data manipulation or conversion, which would basically be the arithmetic and logical type of operations. Then there is data storage and retrieval would be interaction with memory and also the flow control, which basically allows us to change the way a program is executed or change the next instruction that we are going to do rather than always going sequentially one after another. It allows us to break and go to another part of the program and execute from there. These three types of instructions are all that are really necessary in order to get the most general kind of processing capabilities. A further question that we can ask in this context is, the program that we are writing, is it single purpose or is it a general purpose program? What I mean by that is a single program that repeatedly executes. For example, let's say we are trying to do some kind of signal processing. If I want to filter audio data that's coming in on an A to D converter, I would write a very simple program that just reads in the data, filters it and outputs the corresponding values. Similarly, if my job was to create some kind of a clock display, all that I would do would be to count the number of ticks on the internal clock signal, convert that into a set of light control signals and send that out to the appropriate units to display it, display the time. On the other hand, I might also have a more general purpose requirement. Like for example, I have a laptop where I need to be able to do word processing, browsing, checking mail, writing programs, compiling them, writing code, documentation, all of that. I would like to do either these programs one after another or maybe more than one of them executing at the same time. And at the end of the day, I need some way by which I can keep track of these different programs. I need to know what is happening when, I need to know what happened to each one, what should happen next. And each of these programs has some kind of a concept of a return value which basically tells me whether or not the program successfully did its job. All of these are things that we need to keep track of. Examples of programs, again, here I'm slipping into assembly language uh, with the assumption that you understand the basic ideas of what assembly language. Possibly the simplest program that we can think of is one that immediately just calls exit and gets out. You try to invoke the program. What does that mean? You load in the instruction corresponding to the program. What does that instruction do? It tells you to exit. Now, it's not clear what exactly it means to exit from a computer. Right? Because after all, once the CPU is on, it has no notion of exiting until you switch it off. 
So another alternative would basically be just go into a halt mode where all that you do is basically jump to the same location again and again. Fetch the same instruction which tells you once again to jump back to the same location and fetch the same instruction again. All that this does is it basically makes the CPU spin in place, right? It's not going to do anything useful. And because of the way it is structured, it will never come out of this loop, which means that the only way you can get out of it is essentially power down the system. There may be other methods using interrupts and so on, but we are getting ahead of ourselves here. And if you are not exiting the program, another possibility is that we return a value. Once again, what does it mean to return a value? Who are you returning to? Who was it who called you? Who was it to who is reading the value that you return? All of those are important questions to address. And that is where the notion of an operating system comes in. As I said, programs ultimately do some work and finally they have to get out, they have to return. They have to do something and exit the system. In such a scenario, what we need is we might have a situation where we want to execute several programs. Just like the earlier example, there's a code editor, a browser, and maybe a C compiler, right? Should these programs be executed one after another or all at the same time? What does it mean to be able to say that I have two windows open on the screen? Are these programs actually executing at exactly the same time? After all, there's only one processor over there. So how do these things actually execute at the same time? So how can the same time, in other words, simultaneous execution of two programs happen if there's only one CPU? You might of course think that, you know, because your laptop has a dual core or a quad core CPU, there are actually more than one CPU available there, but you could achieve the, exactly the same behavior even if you had only a single CPU. And the reason why this can be done is because the CPU can simply run fast enough and jump between each of these programs quickly enough to fool you into thinking that more than one is running at the same time. But what is this controller that basically takes care of jumping between these different programs fast enough to fool you into believing that they are all running simultaneously? What happens as each one of those programs finishes? Who gets access to memory? Who gets access to the monitor, the display, the keyboard, the mouse, the network interface, the peripherals in general. All of that is where you need a supervisor, which ultimately is also just another program. But its job is purely to supervise the functioning of all the other programs in the system. It takes care of making sure that each of the other programs that is running on your system runs for a certain finite amount of time, then switches over to the next program goes through all the programs that are waiting to execute and then comes back to the first one. If this is done sufficiently fast, you are never going to notice that you actually sort of stopped working on one program for so many milliseconds and then came back. If you can do this, let's say a hundred times per second, and you are trying to sort of switch between two or three different programs, you would never be able to notice the fact that you actually left the program and came back. The CPU would be back to you before you have even typed in two key presses. So to summarize, the core components of a computer, the CPU provides capability. It has the ability to execute instructions. The program provides functionality. It tells the CPU what to do. And the operating system coordinates all of these, coordinates multiple programs and allows you to actually have functionality from the CPU, which allows it to do much more than what would be possible just by having a set of a fixed set of instructions hard coded into the CPU.